The man tells his doctor, Doc, help me. I'm addicted to Twitter. The doctor replied, sorry, I don't follow you. I was diagnosed with antisocial behavior disorder, so I joined a support group. We never meet. <laughs> Philippians chapter four. We're in the third part of a series entitled The Christian and Stewardship. And I'm gonna review some of the things that we've already been talking about. Uh, but, but let me say this. Grab this thought. God wants to be your source. He wants to be your source in all things. He wants to show you that he can give you peace even in the midst of what may look like around you a storm. He wants to be the source of joy. There, there is a joy inexplicable and full of glory that comes from the presence of God. He wants to be your source. He wants to be the one that you look to when you need encouragement. He wants, let me just say it like this way, he wants to be God in your life. Amen. Philippians 4, 19 says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God wants to be our source. He revealed himself as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. And he wants to supply our needs, now listen to this, according to his riches in glory. That is a heavenly storehouse. We are talking about resources that, that have no limitations. We are talking about abundant supply. Now what part do we play in positioning ourselves for him to do that? What part do I play in this process? Last week we said this, and it's in your notes again. It says grace, God's grace comes to us in an area as we yield that area to him. God's grace, that is his ability, his provision comes to us in an area as we yield that area to him. As it comes under his authority. When we put him in charge of an area, his grace, his provision comes into that area in our lives. When he takes ownership of it, he also takes responsibility for it. I shared the example last week of how when I was a young Christian and I was, I was trying to think like a Christian, but I'd been a, a non-Christian for so long that it was, it, was, it was seeping over into my thoughts and I know I was thinking thoughts that I shouldn't be thinking as a Christian and I remember trying so hard, oh God, help me to get a handle on this. And I remember finally one day, it was just so bad, it was actually by that night, I, I just said, God, I give up. I, in my mind, I threw in the towel. You know, I was like, I give up, put up the white flag. I can't do it, I give up, you take my mind. I give it to you. And it was amazing because that next morning I got up that day and it was like, I, it wasn't like there was no temptation, but it was like it was easy to say no. It was like it was easy to say no, I'm not, I don't think those thoughts. I'm a Christian. What kind of thoughts does a turtle think? A turtle thinks turtle thoughts. What kind of thoughts does a Christian think? A Christian should think Christian thoughts. I feel like I'm teaching one and two year olds. No, I'm. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Amen. What was that joke I had last week? Some guy said, he said, you know, I, I just got done doing a, a kid's workout and, and I'm really tired in my fingers, toes, shoulders. <laughs> How does the song go? My, my, yeah. You know, the joke really doesn't come off very good when you don't know it. <laughs> I just did a kid's workout and I'm, I've got places on me that, that hurt. No, it's not, just not the same, just not the same. 
as we surrender an area of our lives to him, he becomes Lord of that area and his grace, his ability and provision flow into that area. And he takes charge of that area. He becomes responsible for it. How do we yield the financial area to him? How do we put him in charge of our finances by obedience, simply obedience? to what he says. We read this verse last week. I'm just, I'm trying to go really quick and review a couple of things we talked about last week because I have these other, I've got some exciting things I want to talk about. Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits or the tithe of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. As we honor God, he honors us. When we yield this area to him by obedience, we position ourselves for him to fulfill his word in our lives. Now one of the most basic financial principles of scripture is found in Leviticus 27.30. And it basically says this, and all the tithe is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. It's like God says, I, I am laying claim on, on 10% of what comes into your life I love, Dave Hubbard told me the other day, he says, man, God's the only one you can work for where, they, where he actually gives you a 90% commission. Yeah. <laughs> but but it, it's almost like God says, that's mine. If you don't give it to me, you're robbing me. If, if you give it to me, it positions you for me to honor you. Um, so let's look at Malachi. I'm just about done reviewing. Malachi chapter three, verse 10. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Tithe is 10% of the increase that God brings us. And we are to bring it to the storehouse that there may be food in his house. In the New Testament, the storehouse is the local church. It's the place where we are being fed. It's the place that, I, that we identify with as our spiritual family. And then he says this, try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. You know, that is an amazing promise that God makes. He gives us permission to try and test him in this area. And he says, see if I will not open the windows of heaven. That, that is a supernatural resource. And, and I will pour out such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. You won't have to rebuke the enemy. You won't have to do it. God says, I'm going to do it for you. Now again, it's important, every time I, I teach on tithing, I feel like I have to balance this w w with this thought. It, it, but let me say this first of all. <laughs> My mind is going so many different directions. I, don't, I'm, I might be thinking like a turtle. I, I'm not sure. It's important to realize that this promise in Malachi it is a promise to the tither. N not the person who would tithe if they had more money. Not the person who would tithe if, if only things were different. Not, not the person who would want, wants to tithe someday. But this is a promise to, of the person who is obedient to God and, and brings to God what God says belongs to him and God makes a promise to him. Now this is the part that I feel like I always need to say. Financial stewardship is not just about tithing. It's not just about being obedient in this area. It's a very significant area. But it's about being faithful with money in general. What do I mean by that? Don't think that you can be a bad steward of money and think that tithing is going to save you. Did I just say that out loud? Let me say it this way. Here is another principle of scripture that is very important. If you are faithful with little, God is going to increase it and he is going to give you more. And so one very important principle with finances in scripture is learning to be faithful with what you have. It may seem like very little, but learning to be faithful with what has been entrusted to you and see that it positions you for God to increase. So what does it mean to be faithful with what I have? It means that you live within your means. 
If you're constantly spending more money than you are taking in, if you are trying to live a lifestyle that is beyond your means, that's not a good stewardship of finances. And see, in our day uh, of credit cards, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I get credit opportunities in the mail every day. I, actually, that's not true. Maybe a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. I, I get opportunities, you know, low, we want to loan you this much money. We want to loan you that. It's very, poss- it's very easy to not live within your means. You can spend more every month than you take in. You can get out, take out loans and do all kinds of foolish things. But here's the thing. It will catch up with you. Whew. And it's a violation of Scripture. You can't ignore what the Scripture says about being faithful with little or what seems like little and think that tithing is going to save you. Does that make sense? Or enable you to continue to live unfaithful with what you have. Tithing will not save you from those things. There are consequences that come with bad choices. You know, when I work with kids in juvie, I, I often use this, this principle, and, and, and most, of, most of the kids know about farming because, you know, this is a, a farming community. It's an agrarian culture that we live in. And, and I, I say, now, the choices that you make are like seeds that you sow in the ground. If you make bad choices, that there are bad seeds that you've sown in the ground and you're going to reap a crop on those bad choices. Now the same is true about good choices. The same is true about making right choices. Some of those kids, they say, man, you know, I, I, look what's happened in my life. I, I don't know what to do. And they start to turn around. They start to make right choices. They start to evaluate where their life is. And I, and, and I say this. Now here's the catch. You can start making right choices. You can start sowing good seed, but you might still have to live in the bad crop you made earlier. You might have to live through that harvest. You might have to live through that crop. But God, I'm making all these right choices. I'm doing things, and I'm, and I'm still like this. God, I, I gave my life to Jesus, and I'm still in juvie. <sighs> but understand that if you make bad choices financially, you, you may have to live with a crop. Even after you start making good choices. But hang in there. Because pretty soon, the bad crop's going to be gone, and what you'll have growing is the good crop. Does that make sense? Thank you, Lord. All right. I could go so many different directions. If you learn to live within your means and to honor God with your tithe, blessing is going to come your way. It can't help but come. When you begin to put God's word into practice in your life, it's going to change everything. How many, how many, how many here have, have experienced the, the miracle of tithing? Or in other words, you, you might have stepped into it and you thought, oh my goodness, what's going to happen to me now that you discovered that God is faithful? Yeah, I mean, isn't he amazing? Isn't he absolutely amazing? Isn't it fun? You know, and he invites us to actually test him and try him in this area. See if I won't do what I said. See if I won't pour out blessing upon your life. Now, I, I, I want to... I want to talk about something here, and I think we have time to do it. I, I want to go deeper in our whole understanding of this area. I, I want to take you on a journey into some spiritual realities, but I need to say something, and I don't know if this will make sense or not, but here it is. Some journeys can only benefit you if you're hungry enough to get out of it what God wants to give you. Isn't it interesting how some people go through difficulties based on bad choices that they've made and it seems like they wake up and they say, man, I'm never doing that again. And then other people just keep doing it and doing it. Why is that? Why don't they extract the wisdom out of that circumstance that comes upon their life? 
And, and there's something, there's a principle in scripture that, that I, I, I kind of summarize it as hunger. You know, when you're hungry for God to intervene in your life, it actually pulls on heaven. When you desire, when it begins to burn in your heart, like God, I, I don't want to stay the same. I, I don't want to go through this again. I want breakthrough in an area. You begin to cry out to God. You begin to be hungry for it. You're positioning yourself to receive more than you will, than a person that is just kind of going through life like, I don't care. I'm fine. Everything's cool. It's all good. But, but, but now I'm not saying we, we walk around, you know, I really got problems. <laughs> but, but I'm saying that there's a hunger for more. There's a hunger for more of God. A desire to, to understand the kingdom. Jesus said this, blessed are those who hunger and thirst because those are the ones that position themselves to be filled. When you're hungry and thirsty, you're the one that's gonna get it. There's a passage of scripture in Luke 153 where he says, he fills the hungry with good things, but the rich he sent away empty. So like here's these hungry people and God has all these good things for them and then there's a person that's rich and kind of like, I'm fine. Everything's cool. And they go home empty. They don't get any more because they're content where they're at. But the hungry, those who want more, those who are not content with where they're, where they're at, God has a special reserve stored up for them. There are certain things that you can only get from God if you're hungry. There are certain understandings that are reserved. It's like they're stored up for those who are hungry for more. So only if you mean it, say this with me. I am so hungry. I must have more, oh God. Give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, the eyes of my understanding, being enlightened that I may know the hope of your calling on my life, that I may know the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints and the exceeding greatness of your power toward us who believe. There's something about hunger that actually opens up your spirit to receive. It, it's like it creates more room in there to contain more. Hunger increases your spiritual capacity. But if you're content, you'll stay where you're at. <clears throat> so, here we go. Everybody okay? It's one thing to see the unseen. We are all called to do that. We are called to walk by faith, to live by faith, and not by sight or the seen realm. That is what faith is. It is living by what you see in the spirit. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen or perceived with the natural eye. Faith sees into the unseen realm and counts it as real and is not moved by, by what is seen with the natural eye. To walk by faith is to believe that the unseen realm is more real than this natural realm or the seen realm. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 4.18. He says, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We are not moved by what we see with our natural eyes. We are, not, we are to be captivated by the unseen realm. Paul has just admonished us and he says, do not look at what you see, but look at what you can't see. That's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? For what is seen is temporal or temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now, is he just talking about having an eternal perspective? 
Is he just saying, you know, walk through this life on earth knowing that you're going to a better place someday and so don't put much stock in this life. Don't, don't get caught up in this life, but, but live for, for, for the future. I don't believe that's what he's saying at all. Now, is that a good thing to do? It is. It is. We need to have an eternal perspective. We need to realize that, that, that we're, 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 in a, we're in boot camp, you might say, for eternity. We're in, we're in time and God is training us during this time and preparing us to rule and reign with Jesus in the heavenlies. You're, you're in a time of preparation. And, and so yes, there, there is a future. You're going you're gonna to step into eternity and time is going to stop. And it'll be a brand new season, let me tell you. And it'll be a season that goes forever. There's nothing wrong with having an eternal perspective. My wife and I have two times now got to sit down with Wayne Myers in Mexico City. He's, he's been a missionary to Mexico for 68 or 9 years. And, and he and his wife are, are, are amazing. And, and I, I sit down with him. Last time we, we spent about an hour and a half with him. And I walked away from that just saying to my wife, man, I need to have an eternal perspective. Because everything he is, everything he does, it is about the kingdom. And, and, and I mean, he is just, he, he, well, never mind. God, God allows thousands and probably millions of dollars to flow through his hands. And he doesn't own a car. He doesn't own a house. But I mean, he's sowing in the kingdom. Sowing into churches, putting roofs on churches all over Mexico and other parts of the world. Amazing man. And we sit down with him and I just walk over from that thinking, I need to get saved. <laughs> Who then can be saved? So I, I'm not saying anything against an eternal perspective. But I'm saying I don't believe that's what Paul is talking about here, in all, here at all. It's one thing to see the unseen. It's another thing to live from the unseen realm because it's real right now. We're not talking about now and then. We're talking about which realm is moving you. Which realm is impacting your life. It's one thing to see the unseen. It's, it's another thing to begin to live from it, to, to begin to live from the kingdom of God instead of the natural realm. When we contrast the, the temporal versus the eternal, are we talking about what exists now and what will exist later? Or are we talking about two realms that actually exist simultaneously right now? There is a natural realm. There is a spiritual realm. One is the seen realm. One is the unseen realm. It is one thing to see into the unseen. It is another thing to begin to live in and from the unseen realm. Remember, Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom because it's unseen. It requires a different pair of eyes. It requires a different ability. And he said, if you're born of water and the spirit, you actually enter into the kingdom of God. You and I have entered into and God is calling us to live from the kingdom. Now I, I know I'm saying a lot of things and hopefully it'll make sense in just a moment. I want to take you on a journey that Mickey and I began about 10 years ago. Now I've been a tither for over 40 years. I have tithed through easy times and not so easy times. I, I have tithed when, when, when it was very challenging but all I can say is God is faithful, 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 faithful. If you honor God, he will honor you. But a, a little over 10 years ago, God began to challenge us kind of on another dimension or at least to broaden our understanding of this area. When you go to another nation, it's really important that you learn some things about that nation if you're going to operate or live in that nation, especially, especially if you're going to be there for a while. In 2003, my wife tr and I traveled to Brazil for the very first time. And, and they told us, they said, now, there's certain things that, that you need to learn about this nation that will help you uh, flow, that will help make things easy, easier. And they said this, now, in America, if someone says to you, how you doing? You might say, doing good. Anybody ever done that? 
It, it means okay, it means what? Don't do that in Brazil. You cannot probably slam somebody worse than, than, than giving them that signal. They said, don't do that. In fact, I want you to start practicing before we go there. Do this. Do this. Don't do this. Do this. A couple times in there, I, I go. <laughs> this, is, this is pretty good universally. Don't do this. Do this. This means, why don't you haul off and go to heaven? No, I'm... This always means good. I'm doing good. Things are fine. How are you doing? Good. It's a good signal. But, but you, can, you can understand that you need to learn things like that. If you go to Saudi Arabia and you're in, in business with somebody, whatever you do, don't, do not cross your legs. Because if they see the bottom of your foot, that is an absolute insult to them. How many think that might be good to know? If you're in business. And, and there, there are just little things like that that will help you navigate in, in those situations because sometimes in one country things are different than in another country. Now see, you have all been born again into the kingdom of God. You have be, become part of a new country. Actually, it's a holy nation. And, and you've entered into the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God operates differently than the world. And we need to understand how the kingdom operates and learn how to release the resources of that kingdom. So my wife and I got married and we were living in an apartment. And now understand, before that, I lived in three different houses that I'd owned. Three different houses. And now I'm living in an apartment. You wouldn't believe it, man. I could not even play my guitar without the neighbors complaining. Like, I've never had that. Like, I've been in a house, you know, I could turn my amp up. You know, I could do things like that, but now I'm in an apartment, and I'm just thinking, wow, this is challenging. And, and, and Lord, we, we want to get in a house, you know, so we started looking for a house. We wanted to buy a house. And this is what we discovered. <laughs> the houses that we could afford, we didn't want to live in. The houses that we wanted to live in, we couldn't afford And so it caused us to be very creative in our thinking and to pray and say, God, what do we do? And he led us to become the general contractors of building our own house. Now, that can be a challenge, huh, Dad? I remember when we informed Dad that we were building a house. He kind of said, Are you, do, you, uh, do you know what you're getting into? But you know, we thought, well, we'll just... We'll save money on sweat equity, and it worked. You know, when we, when we finished building the house, it was worth about $40,000 more than, than, than uh, what we had put into it. And so that, that was a good idea for us. It worked, and, and we, we ended up building this house. But, but when we're building it, there was a time, I mean, we never stopped tithing or doing that, but there was a time when money got so tight. And, and it's like, we still have things to do. We probably should put a roof on this. You know, that we should probably have plumbing. I would like plumbing. <laughs> you know, and, and I, to be honest, I kept thinking of a story in Luke chapter 14 uh, uh, that Jesus told, and he said, whenever, this is in chapter 14, verse 27, and, and, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So he's talking about counting the cost of discipleship, being willing to pay the price to be his disciple. And then he tells this story. He says, for which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it? Lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And I kept saying, Lord, don't let me be that guy. Because I, I, I just, you know, I just had this, this imagination. We had people that told us, don't, don't do this. We had a guy that built his own house. He came up to us one day and says, what has come over you? Where did you come up with such a crazy, and this is a guy that built a house. And he began to share with me all the things that went wrong. All the different things that, that didn't work. 
And I'm thinking, Lord, don't let me be that person. They tried to discourage me. And now I imagine, you know, there'd be a point where they'll say, you know, I, I told you. I told you. I'm crying out to God. And about this time, we had this midweek service and we had this, uh, this uh, missionary come in and share. And, and I love missionaries. Uh, if you know me, you know I've got a soft spot in my heart for missionaries. Anybody that takes the gospel into another man, you've got, I, I'm encouraged by you and I'm gonna encourage you as much as I can because you're, you're doing what God has called you to do. And we had this missionary come and it, great missionary, had a great vision, doing a great work for God. And I remember thinking, Lord, you know I love to give to missionaries. I said, but I just don't have it. You know, I almost felt spiritually like, a, you ever pull out your pockets so they hang out? That's kind of what I did in the spirit. I don't have any. And, and I felt like the Lord did this. That's the only way I can describe it. I felt like he, like he went. And I thought, I don't, yikes. And so I told my wife, I, I said, you know, I, I was in this service and I wanted to give and I didn't have any money to give because you know how tight things are. And uh, I said, uh, what do you think that was? And she says, I think the Lord is speaking to us. I think the Lord wants us to, to, to give our way out of this place that we're in. I feel like the Lord wants to break something off of us. I said, okay. And I remember shortly after that, it's probably three weeks later, we're, we're at this luncheon for a, a, a missionary. He's a teach, he was a teacher here in town and he was going off in the mission field of Guatemala to be a teacher for all of the missionaries there to teach their kids while they're in that other country. I mean, it was, it was a great thing. And, and I, 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 I looked at my wife, I kind of looked at her like this. Kind of like, you know, like, is God speaking to you? And, and, I, and I, I just w went over and I just whispered. I said, you know, I, I feel like we're supposed to give something. She says, I, I do too. And, and, and I said, well, how much do you think we should give? And it was just the exact amount that I had. And my, my wife writes out this check. And, and, and I can still remember this just clear as day. She writes it out and she tears it out. She goes, in your face, devil. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that is crystal clear to me. In your face, devil. And... and you know, it's really interesting because I don't know what happened because like, it wasn't like somebody came over and brought us money that I remember, but all I know is something broke and we just finished the house and everything was fine. And, and, and God just challenged us that, you know, don't, don't just, he was breaking a poverty mentality off of our lives. And it comes off in levels. Because about the time you think you're free, you might find out that God wants to make you freer. <laughs> and so now, it's, it's August 2004. This was about 11 years ago. We're flying to Belize. We're, I'm on a three-week vacation. Mickey isn't. Uh, but I'm on a three-week vacation. Longest vacation I've ever had in my life. It was amazing. And, and we're, we're, the first leg of that is we're going to Belize. We are going to be ministering at a YWAM base camp, but, but for the most part, it was vacation. We were going to go out on Amber Grease Key and, and just spend some downtime. And, and we really needed some downtime. And, and I'm, I'm in the plane. We're flying from Seattle to somewhere, and, and I'm, I'm doing my devotions on my computer, which I always do. And I just happen to be in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. And I, uh, I, I'm right there, and I'm reading, and, and I get to about verse 19, and I read through the end of the chapter, and I felt like the Lord said, read that again, starting in verse 19. So I, I read it again, and he said, I want you to begin to meditate on this passage of Scripture because you are going to need it for the season that I'm bringing you into. The next season of your life, you are going to need this. So I want you to meditate. I want you to, to, to absorb some things out of this passage of Scripture. And so in my mind, I imagined I would be vacationing all of vacation. That I would be meditating on that passage for three weeks. It was more like 12 months. And it was really an interesting season because it was like I kept reading through this passage of scripture because I already knew what it meant. Or I thought I did. 
Have you ever done that? You have a passage of scripture and, and you've, you know what it means. You've, you understand what he's saying. But then as you really spend some time on it, you really realize that the Holy Spirit wants to do a paradigm shift inside of you so you begin to see it differently. Verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and, and in steal. Now, this is how I interpreted this passage before. Anything we might want to store up has real limitations in this realm, which is true. Um, moth and rust, inflation, interest rates, stock market crashes, thievery. It can be broken into. It happens every day. There is no guarantee on the things in this realm. Now, that's all true. Verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. That which is deposited in your heavenly bank account, it cannot be messed with by the enemy. There's nothing that can go after it. There's no moth, there's no rust, there's no inflation. There's, it, it's impregnable in that sense. And then he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So in the past, this is how I would have interpreted these words. Don't worry about stuff now. Don't store up stuff in this life while you're here on earth. Because everything down here will pass away. Just worry about your heavenly treasure. Because things in heaven, they don't pass away. So live now for years from now when you will be in heaven. This is how I would have interpreted that passage. Now, some of that is true prior to this time. But this is what I, I began to see that Jesus was saying to me as I, as, as I read it. Now, let me just read it again. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Don't let the natural realm be where you put your trust to live now, right now. But put your, don't put your confidence in this realm. It is so easily shaken. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. When, when you honor God in your giving, you are making deposits in your heavenly account. And there's nothing that the enemy can do to mess with that account. And it's not just for when you get to heaven. It's a resource that you can actually live from right now. You can make withdrawals from it right now. And see, when you are trusting in God, when you are trusting in the heavenly realm, God has your heart. And that's the next verse. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where you put your true value, that is where your heart is. And this is what I began to see. He was talking about in your notes. Which realm are you going to trust in? The earthly or the heavenly? The seen or the unseen? The temporal or the eternal? The natural or the spiritual? Luke's version of this says this. Luke 12, 33, it says, provide yourselves money bags that do not grow old, a treasure in heaven that does not fail. See, Jesus came to the earth and he modeled a lifestyle. He modeled the Christian life. He is our example. We, we follow him. How did Jesus live? He came and he brought his kingdom with him. He was never subject to the limitations of the realm that he lived in. He, 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 was, he, did, he, he had another source. He lived out of, of a heavenly resource. And so when, when, uh, when there were hundreds of people to feed, he could feed them with a the boy's lunch. How did he do that? He tapped into a, a heavenly bank account. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. When, when Peter needed to pay his taxes, he just sent him fishing. And he said, you'll, you'll find the money you need in the mouth of the first fish you catch. That's kingdom. He never lived subject to the limitations of this realm because when he came, he brought his kingdom with him. In fact, the message was, behold, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Do you know what he's really saying? He's saying, change the way you're thinking because the kingdom of God is within reach. 
Change the way you're thinking because you, you see everything from the natural perspective. But you're, it, it's not just a, a turning away from sin, but it's turning away from a whole different way of thinking into a whole new way of thinking where God is our source, God is our provision. We actually live out of him. Did Jesus do that? See, Ephesians 1.3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So God has blessed us with all of these spiritual blessings, but they, but they are in heavenly places. Well, that must mean heaven. Oh boy, can't wait till we get to heaven where we can be with where all those blessings are. But the problem with that kind of an understanding is you better stop reading the book of Ephesians because it's gonna change it. If you read chapter two, verses four and six, it says this, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when you were, we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are where the blessings are. God has blessed us in heavenly places with all these blessings and he's brought you up there and seated you with him in heavenly places. You are where the blessings are. What, are, what is he saying? He says, I, I want to teach you how I lived. Jesus didn't live from earth towards heaven. Jesus didn't live. Oh God, we've got a problem down here. There's, there's a woman, she's really dead. God, we, we, don't, we don't really have enough food here. He didn't live from earth towards heaven. He lived from heaven towards earth. He lived in a place where he was actually positioned by God as we are to release the resources of heaven into the earth. There's a really interesting scripture in your Bible that's found in John chapter three. I'm gonna just read it real quick. Verse 13. No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. <laughs> no one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven that is the son of man who is in heaven now wait a minute now, wasn't he on earth when he said this or was he was he living where he has positioned us as we've been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus he was living from, from heaven towards earth now let's go back to Luke chapter six. Stand up and just stretch for a minute. Uh. Now when I do this, that doesn't mean that I'm gonna go on for another hour. <laughs> I, I'm just saying that because some of you are thinking, man, I could run out of here right now. <laughs> I'm gonna be done on time, okay? Okay, sit down and relax. How many have ever been reading the words of Jesus and you're reading along here and then all of a sudden it seems like he absolutely changed the subject. You know, first he's talking about this, now he's talking about that. See, I used to think that. You know, he talks about, you know, don't trust in, in, in natural resources, trust in spiritual resources. God wants to have your heart. And then he says this, verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. Oh, now we're talking about something else. Or are we? If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, let's just talk about that for a minute. If your eye is good, that the word actually means single. If your focus is on the right realm, if you are trusting in the right realm, if you are 
your whole life will be filled with light. Now light speaks of revelation and spiritual understanding. A lamp is a source of illumination. It gives light. Now, so let me paraphrase this passage of scripture in light of this new understanding. The source of illumination, I may have this in the notes, I may not. The source of illumination for your life is, is your focus, your vision. For your focus is good. If it's single, if you are focused on and trusting in the right realm, your whole life will be full of revelation and spiritual understanding. In other words, if I am trusting in this natural realm, if that's where my focus is, if that's what I'm trusting in, I might think I'm getting revelation, but if I'm focused on the wrong realm, my revelation is darkness. Now let let me just keep reading. Because it, it is out of trust in the heavenly realm that revelation comes. But if your focus is bad, evil, focused on and trusting in the wrong realm, your whole life will be full of darkness. The word is actually obscurity. If therefore the revelation or light that is in you is obscure, how great is that obscurity? He's saying that I'm trying to have you understand that that. I want to have your heart. I want to be your God. I want to be the one that you're trusting in. And if you put your trust in me, then I have your heart and, and, and your eye will be in such a way that I can give you revelation and spiritual understanding of many things because of what you're trusting in. Does that make sense? And he says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. One cannot focus on, pursue, and trust in God and money because he says you will end up loving one and hating the other. You will end up being loyal to one and despising the other. We can only have one God and our God is who or what we pursue and trust in. Now based on this revelation that Jesus has just given us, Christianity is an absolutely worry-free life. Based on this revelation that he has given us, we are called to a place, well, let, let me just keep reading. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. So he's saying, don't worry about food or clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Do you know that birds don't sow or reap like like farmers? Do you know that they don't gather into barns? They don't have a, a store place? They have no bank account. They have no reserve and yet God feeds them and he says you are more valuable to God than they are. If he cares for them, don't you think he's going to care for you? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Can, Can worry actually produce anything productive? It's a waste of time and energy. It is what people do if they don't know God. It is what the Gentiles do. Verse 28, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. The lilies of the field do not labor or work, and and, and yet they're beautifully clothed. Solomon in all of his, well, let's just keep reading. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So God, if, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So God takes care of temporal things like grass, flowers. How much more will he take care of us is what he's saying. You guys are sure quiet. Therefore, now when you see the word therefore, you need to discover what it's there for. It always means he said something, and in light of that, therefore. Therefore, do not worry 
saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. The world is living a lifestyle that is focused on those things. God knows you need those things. He made you. He knows you have a stomach. He knows you need food. He knows you have a body. He knows you need clothes. And then he makes this amazing, amazing proposition. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Here's the deal. Focus on the kingdom, pursue it above all else, and everything you need will be added to you. Now, I'm, I'm gonna say something that I probably shouldn't even bother trying to say because it might bring confusion. Maybe I shouldn't say it. <laughs> I don't think the deal is this. I don't think he's saying, okay, if you do this, I will do this. I don't think he's saying that. If you seek first my kingdom, then I will take care of all these needs. This is what I believe he's saying. If you will seek me first, you will get the kingdom, and the kingdom has everything you need. The kingdom comes complete with everything that you will ever need. If you seek me first, if you seek first my kingdom, you're going to have everything that you need. I want to close with this verse of scripture. Luke 12, 32. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, in my previous theology, I would say, hey, we get to go to heaven when we die. But I don't think that's what he's saying at all. He's saying, hey, the God wants to give you his kingdom. He wants to teach you how his kingdom operates so that you can learn to actually live out of his kingdom. It's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And with the kingdom comes everything that you need. With the kingdom comes all of the resources of that kingdom. Let's stand together. I want to invite the worship team to come up. I would like to sing that song, No Longer Slaves, one more time. I really believe this is a powerful song. Did, did that message today make sense? Yes. <laughs> Thanks.
That's who you are. A child of God, yes. born of the Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Father, we just thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and in our lives. Father, teach us kingdom. Teach us kingdom. Show us how your kingdom operates. Show us how we can cooperate with you. Lord, in releasing blessing and releasing peace, releasing life into other people's lives, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite the prayer teams to come up and be available this morning to pray. The benediction is out of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Now to him who was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. God bless you saints. Have a great, great week.